Everybody, welcome to the Financial State of Canadians and the Impact on Charitable Giving webinar. Um, we're excited to all have you here. And uh, my name is Alan Davidoff. I'm the Senior Vice President and Practice Leader here at Enveronic Analytics. I will be your host today. Um, and I'm super excited about the lineup and the webinar that we'll be speaking to you about. Um, but before I get started, why don't I get to some housekeeping? So we're going to put everyone, and you guys all probably are used to this, um, as you've been doing this for the last two years, we're going to put everyone to listen mode only. Um, please do use the Q&A feature, submit your questions. You can submit them um, with your name or anonymously, but we will uh, be checking that as well as the chat. So if you have questions, if you want to have a discussion with others and sort of throw things out there, please use the two uh, functions. And just a reminder, the presentation will be recorded um, and we will make it available um, in the following couple of days um, with an email. So both attendees and those that couldn't make it last minute, you will, everybody will be getting it. So um, just a reminder, because I know that question does come up. And now um, just want to go through the land acknowledgement. Um, we think it's important. Uh, we want to acknowledge the land of where our head office resides in the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anish Nabeg, the Chippewa, the, I, I apologize, I have trouble pronouncing some of this, the Hanasani and the Wendat peoples, and now home to the many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Metis people. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. And now to our speakers. I'm super excited about the speakers that you all will hear today. Um, so first off, I wanna introduce Lynn Wolfson. Uh, Lynn is the research lead for the financial data products here at Enveronics Analytics. Lynn brings over a decade of experience in financial research and data analysis, and is responsible for overseeing the development of EA's household financial products by studying the macroeconomic trends and implementing statistical best practices to improve methodology. Uh, before joining EA, Lynn worked at TD Bank and she holds under, uh, an undergraduate degree and a master's degree in mathematics from Carleton University and a master's in financial mathematics from McMaster University. Um, and I am doing this in the order that people will be speaking today. I should have mentioned that ahead of time. Um, after her, um, Jennifer Robbins will be speaking. Jen uh, helps clients solve their business challenges using the Enveronics Analytics suite of data products and services. Jen is the Director of Business Development and our NFP lead. For those that haven't met Jen, uh, feel free to reach out to her at any time after this. She brings 15 years of sales, marketing, and analytics experience across education, travel, finance, not-for-profit, government, and healthcare industries. Jen holds an Honors Bachelor of Arts degree in French and Marketing Management from the University of Guelph and a Master's in Business Administration degree from Holt International Business School. And last, but very not least, is our special guest speaker today, Jessica Dennis. She's the Chief Development Officer at JDRF Canada. Uh, thank you so much, Jen, uh, Jennifer, ah, Jessica, I got your names confused. I apologize um, for joining us today. Jessica Dennis is a seasoned senior executive with over 20 years of experience in development, marketing communications, corporate partnerships, major gifts, peer-to-peer -peer fundraising, and leading high-performance teams. Jessica joined JRDF in 2015, a global not-for-profit focused on fun funded research into a cure for type 1 diabetes, where she had provided strategic leadership and oversight for national events, fundraising programs, marketing communications, community engagement, and regional fundraising teams. Most recently, most recently, Jessica launched JRDF's largest major gift campaign to date, um, and you'll hear a little bit about it today, the JRDF's 100 million campaign to accelerate in 2020, shifting the organizations to a donor center model and driving efficient fundraising programs such as annual giving um, and major gift fundraising. Jenica, Jessica has significant experience developing strategic plans and partnering with boards and senior volunteer leaders. And we are so, so, so excited to have her here to talk about the work that they've done at JRDF. Um, so thank you all. And again, just an agenda for those that um, haven't seen it on the email. We're first gonna talk about Wellscapes. 
So Lynn will go through some of the updates that we have in our Wildscapes products and sort of um, give you a sense of some of the changes. We'll talk about the financial state of the nation. How are Canadians doing as we have been going through the pandemic? Um, Jen will then talk about the interge intergenerational transfer of wealth. Um, I'm a little tongue tied today for some reason. Um, and also some Canadian giving trends. So that's some really great stuff. And then the exciting part, Jessica will be talking about building your prospect pipeline and the work that they've been doing at JRDF and some of the success stories that they have. So let's get to the good stuff. Lynn, do you wanna take it away? Thanks, Alan. We've been making Wellscapes annually at EA for the past 14 years. It's Canada's most comprehensive commercially via commercially available database of household assets, debts, and income. Available down to the neighborhood level, we produce estimates of balances and incidences for 38 categories of assets and liabilities using state-of-the-art modeling techniques together with the most current and authoritative data from sources like the Bank of Canada, Statistics Canada, and Equifax. It can be used to generate insights across multiple sectors, such as financial institutions, charitable organizations, large retailers, and government agencies. In order to help users understand how market and demographic shifts have impacted their target audience, Wellscapes includes data for both the most recent year and the previous year. For the 2021 vintage released last summer, that would be 2019 and 2020 year ends. During the first year of COVID, as a means to help institutions better understand how market fluctuations and policy changes were, were rapidly affecting the wealth of Canadian households, we developed Wealth Trends, a quarterly update on 20 key statistics in Wealthscapes. Although the majority of the data I will be sharing with you today come from our most recent vintage of Wealthscapes, I will also, in some cases, look at how things have evolved through the first three quarters of 2021 using data from Wealth Trends. But before we do, I want to talk a little about what Wealthscapes is and some key improvements we've made this year. As mentioned previously, Wealthscapes is built using data from a wide variety of sources. The model takes the authoritative estimates of total household wealth published by Statistics Canada's macroeconomic accounts and assigns each dollar down to the neighborhood level. We do this by looking to multiple sources of, sources of microeconomic data such as neighborhood level aggregate income tax data from CRA and debt data from Equifax, two financial surveys, the Survey of Financial Security by Statistics Canada and the Canadian Financial Monitor by Ipsos, and up-to-date house price index data, to name a few. Multiple types of statistical and optimization techniques are used to combine all this data together and ultimately produce the estimates in Wealthscapes. At Enveronix, we are constantly striving to keep our models state-of-the-art by introducing new data sources and techniques as they become available. In, in the 2021 vintage, we made several model enhancements, including extending the asset and debt coverage by better leveraging the statistics available to the household macroeconomic accounts pub published by StatsCan, adding new asset and liability breakdowns to the variable list, and incorporating new higher resolution data from CRA. Before getting into the details, let's get a high level look at net worth as it is published in Wealthscapes. The model is composed of both assets and liabilities as seen in the chart presented. The asset side of the household balance sheet is broken down into four main components, unlisted shares, liquid assets, real estate, and pensions. Real estate is the largest contributor to net worth with the majority of that balance coming from household ownership of their principal residence. For liquid assets, most of the money is allocated to investments, such as stocks, bonds, and funds, but Canadian households also keep a sizable portion of their assets in checkings and savings accounts. In terms of liabilities, we can see that mortgage debt is by far the largest slice, followed by loans and lines of credit, with only a sliver coming from credit card debt. This year, we added three new categories to the product. In dark blue, Unlisted shares, otherwise known as private equity, is the only new addition visible on this chart. Although it is considered to be a financial asset, since unlisted shares are generally illiquid, the new category has been kept separate from the other more liquid financial assets. The remaining two additions are not shown on this chart. ETFs, 
or exchange traded funds are a subset of mutual funds and HELOCs or home equity lines of credit are a type of secured line of credit. Last year, we rebuilt from the ground up the guts of the financial assets portion of Wealthscapes. Every neighborhood in Wealthscapes is composed of a set of households and getting an accurate estimate of the distribution of wealth across those households is very helpful especially in diverse neighborhoods where the average does not necessarily reflect the true mix. Here is a snapshot of the distribution we got this year for the financial assets of the households of Canada. We can see that the top 5% of households have over half the financial assets and Wellscapes can help you find the neighborhoods in which these households live. As another example of enhancements made to Wellscapes this year, for the first time ever, we've been able to get taxation data at the dissemination area level, resulting in exceptionally granular estimates of liquid assets. For example, this map shows the affluent South Rosedale neighborhood in Toronto. The purple area is a single census tract and each area within is a DA or dissemination area. These DAs are all quite affluent, but now we are doing an even better job separating the mostly modestly affluent from the very affluent living a few blocks over. In this case, we estimate that the richest DA has nearly double the liquid asset balance of the least rich, 3.2 versus 1.8 million. At the end of my section, I'm gonna show how we can use the liquid assets product to delve even deeper to see how non-uniform the households within these DAs are. Now that we've talked about Wealthscapes, what it is and how it's been enhanced this year, I'm sure you are all eager to see what insights it provides. The COVID pandemic made 2020 a year unlike we had ever seen before. There were global shutdowns and supply chain disruptions, schools were closed and international travel halted. Household behaviors changed rapidly, including their patterns of earnings, consumption and savings. As the pandemic dragged through its second year, society adapted to the new normal with continuing impacts to household finances. Government financial interventions like EI and CERB injected large sums of cash into the household sector while monetary policy drove interest rates down. At the beginning of the pandemic, would anybody have imagined that households would emerge an average of $65,000 wealthier at the end of 2020? Did households retain that wealth bump through 2021 or even further increase it? and of I'm sure high relevance to the audience, how did the COVID-19 pandemic affect Canadian households' ability to give? There are two key drivers to changes in household wealth, savings rates and investment performances. In a typical year, the latter has a larger impact. So let's start with examining the performance of markets households are most heavily invested in. The stock market, which saw some steep declines at the beginning of the pandemic, recovered through the remainder of the year as investors grew more confident. The TSX finished 2020 with a modest 5.6% increase. The second year of the pandemic saw large growth in the TSX, increasing by around a quarter. It was fixed income and real estate that were the big movers in 2020. Government stimulus and monetary policy pushed rates to historic lows. The five-year Government of Canada bond yield declined by one and a quarter percent to just 0.4%. The low interest rates drove up real estate prices across the country as households had easy access to cheap mortgages. But as we will see, accompanying changes in household behavior, as well as local economic conditions, meant that this increase was by no means uniform. In 2021, interest rates started to creep back up, leading to a slight decrease in bond values, but seemingly no dampening effect on real estate. So how do these market trends, as well as the behavior changes of households, impact the various components of household wealth in 2020 and beyond? Let's take a look. Here we have a time series of the quarterly average household balances for four key components of wealth, real estate, investments, debt, and deposits. Through 2020, we can see that real estate has really taken off, growing from below 400,000 to around 430,000, after being relatively flat for the two preceding years. A similar acceleration can be seen with deposits, but unlike real estate gains, which are due to asset price increase, the increase in deposits is due to a substantial increase in the average savings rates of households, either due to an increase in average income 
decreased consumer spending, or both. We see the investment balance growth tracking well with what happened in the financial markets, with a sharp decline in Q1, followed by a, re by a recovery through the rest of the year. So how does this all add up for Canadian households? At the end of 2020, average household net worth sat at $795,000, a full $65,000 higher than a year before. There were two big stories going on here driving this increase. Real estate was by far the largest driver of the change, with surging valuations contributing a full 40,000 of the 65,000 growth. The other main contributor was liquid assets, which increased approximately $24,000 per household. But what is standout in 2020 is that almost half of the increase was in the form of demand deposits, which increased a staggering 18%. Such a dramatic increase in cash holdings may be indicative of a household sector that was being cautious given the economic uncertainty around the COVID pandemic. Although consumer debt did not make a meaningful contribution to the total change in average net worth, it is worth noting how unusual it is for it to decline year over year. The majority of this decrease came from non-secured revolving debt like credit cards and unsecured lines of credit, indicating that many households use their excess cash to pay down high interest debt. Loans were up slightly, and with a hot real estate market, it's not surprising that mortgages and HELOCs saw commensurate increases. Most of the charts in the remainder of this section will follow a similar format. The top chart starts with Canada on the left, and then travels across the Canadian provinces from west to east. The Atlantic provinces, as well as the territories, were combined into single bars on the right. The lower chart shows a selection of metropolitan areas ordered from largest to smallest. We've added in southwestern Ontario, which we define as the combined metropolitan areas of Hamilton, Kitchener-Cambridge-Waterloo, London, St. Catharines, Hamilton, and Windsor. Our first chart, shown on this slide, has the average household net worth for the geographies just mentioned. Across the board, all the provinces had an increasing net worth through 2020. There are some clearer regional patterns going on with Canada east of Manitoba seeing larger increases than Western Canada. For the metropolitan areas, we see some variation within provinces. For example, Ottawa increased more than Toronto and Montreal increased more than Quebec. Here, we have the average net worth for provinces and regions broken down by asset and liability type on the top chart and the year-over-year -year change on the bottom chart. Debt is in red, liquid assets in blue, real estate in green, and pension in light green. We can see in the top chart that British Columbia has the highest average net worth per household at just over $1 million, but Ontario is rapidly closing the gap, sitting at $950,000. Real estate is the largest asset class held by Canadian households and explains much of the regional differences, although there is also some variation in the level of liquid assets, with British Columbia, Alberta, and Ontario having noticeably higher balances than the other regions. Looking at the 2020 year-over-year -year changes in the lower chart, the purple line shows the total change in average household net worth, while the other bars follow the same colors as the chart above. We can see, see here what underlies the e that east-west difference we saw on the previous slide, real estate. Ontario, Quebec, and Atlantic Canada all have much larger increases in net worth coming from real estate than from liquid assets, whereas the prairies have more of the increase coming from liquid assets. When we look at the metropolitan areas, the role of real estate growth is further magnified, especially in Ottawa and southwestern Ontario. Here, I recategorize the bars just slightly to give a different view of net worth. Instead of having a single category for debt, I removed mortgages and combined them with real estate to create a category called net real estate. This is the equity households have in real estate. The remaining debt is the much smaller consumer debt category. This perspective is interesting because it highlights that in most regions, the bulk of the net worth growth are coming from increased equity in real estate. Although this may make households feel wealthier and thus more generous, there could still be barriers to giving, such as cash flow issues or uncertainty about the future. 
Nevertheless, real estate was certainly one of the biggest financial stories for households during the pandemic. So let's dig into it deeper. These charts show average real estate values. While all markets saw strong increases, the range was quite broad, from a few percent on the low end to a whopping 18% in Ottawa. So while all markets benefited from steep decline in borrowing costs, regional demand was still driving the majority of the changes. Differences in regional demand can be caused by many things, such as local economic conditions, demographic trends, and consumer tastes. Coming back to that whopping 18% in Ottawa, it is not typical to see that region increase so much more than Toronto. Southwestern Ontario also had a very large increase. With Wellscapes, we can dig even deeper here to try to understand what is happening. These maps show the percent change in average real estate values for regions within Ontario and Quebec, with darker colors representing larger increases and lighter colors representing smaller increases. Although the real estate values were up everywhere, there is an unmissable pattern here. In Ontario, we can see a light area inside the GTA and darker areas through the rest of Southern Ontario, particularly Ottawa. A similar pattern is observed in Quebec with the lighter area seen in Montreal and darker areas in the surrounding regions. But it doesn't end here, so let's zoom in further. Now we can see an even finer geographic detail within the Toronto, Ottawa Gatineau, and Montreal metropolitan areas. Within Montreal and Toronto, there is a movement away from the downtown core. In Montreal, this is particularly pronounced on the South Shore, especially in areas further from the bridges. Even in Ottawa, which saw an average increase in 2020 much larger than in other areas of the province, we see that the change was even larger in the suburbs than in the city. Center. One has to wonder if what we are seeing here is a direct consequence of many households shifting to remote work during the pandemic and thus changing where they choose to live. This could have real implications when it comes to knowing what regions in which your donor base is living. The hall real estate market kept going strong into 2021, with increases over the first three quarters being comparable to the total 2020 change in most markets. The combined increase over the seven quarters since the pandemic began was a staggering 30% for the country, with some markets, such as Ottawa and Southwest Ontario, being well north of 40%. This roaring real estate market will have impacts on household financial behavior and giving ability for years to come. Younger households may be less inclined to give as they tighten their budgets to save up for ever larger down payments, while older households may have more equity available for planned giving, provided they do not draw it down for their children or grandchildren's down payments, that is. With increases in real estate value also come increases in mortgage debt, which raises concerns about debt servicing costs in the future. But actually, debt to disposable income was down across all provinces in 2020. Even though there was a modest 2% increase in debt, driven mostly by increased mortgage debt, there was an increase in income that more than compensated for it. Even as Canada saw upwards of 25% unemployed during periods of 2020, average household income rose approximately 10%, possibly as a result of the large government transfers. But while the government transfers are temporary, mortgage debt has more permanence. So it will be interesting to see how this changed over the course of 2021, as government transfers winded down and mortgage debt continued to grow. We'll also be keeping an eye on things through 2022 with servicing costs, in particular interest rates, are expected to rise and disposable income will likely continue to be eroded by inflation. Liquid assets is the final component of net worth that we will address. As we saw earlier, it was the second biggest mover in 2020, surpassed only by real estate. The outsized change was really coming from an 18% surge in demand deposits combined with a more modest increase of 6% on investments. Unlike real estate, however, the changes across the country are strikingly similar. With household savings rates and market-based investment returns being the two key drivers in liquid asset changes, it is not surprising the changes are regionally similar. The average savings rate of Canadian households skyrocketed in 2020, but since this was caused by forces that acted on the country as a whole, such as lockdowns and changes to income patterns, 
it is not surprising to see a uniform geographic impact. Similarly, the change in value of household investment portfolios are not terribly correlated with where a particular household is located. Unlike real estate, which is highly location dependent, when the stock market and bond markets rise in Toronto, they also rise in Vancouver and Halifax. So that dramatic increase in demand deposits is actually seen across the country, only varying by plus or minus a few percent. Similarly, investments grew by a fairly uniform rate of between four to six percent. This resulted in a consistent shift in portfolio allocation across the country from about 20% in demand deposits up to 22%. Did Canadians continue to stock away deposits through the first three quarters of 2021? Using data from wealth trends, we can see that the growth of deposits versus investments is stable over the first three quarters of 2021. Although both continue to rise, their relative proportions remained the same. Perhaps Canadians felt their deposits were sufficiently shored up, or maybe households had learned how to shift consumption spending to industries not affected by lockdowns. Although this looks like a good news story when it comes to Canadians' ability to give, I'll once again bring up the fact that we may be entering a sustained period of inflation that could erode these gains over time. Moreover, these increases did not occur uniformly across the wealth distribution, having implications for potentially both the mission and fundraising aspect of not-for-profit institutions. Although Wealthscapes is invaluable for comparing key differences in average characteristics between neighborhoods, sometimes it can be useful to look at differences for the mix of households within a particular neighborhood. Wrapping up my section, let's get a view from the liquid assets product within the Wealth Suite. This product allows us to break down the distribution of household liquid assets within each neighborhood by age group, income level, and liquid asset tier. While Wealthscape shows some times dramatic differences in wealth between neighborhoods, liquid assets gets at the sometimes just as dramatic differences within neighborhoods. For example, that Rosedale census tract that I was showing at the beginning of the presentation that had a moderately wide range of between 1.8 million and 3.2 million average liquid assets for its DAs. If we look at the mix of households within that census tract, our models estimate that only a third of those households have over a million in liquid assets while well, more than a quarter actually have less than 100,000. The chart here shows the relationship between age and income when it comes to savings and investment levels. While it's clear that there is a sharp rise in liquid assets as households approach retirement age, we can see that young income households actually have, young high income households actually have a larger nest egg than retirement age low income households. And that wraps up my section on the financial state of Canadian households. In summary, through 2020 and beyond, the COVID pandemic had some pretty significant effects. In 2020, mortgage rates plummeted, real estate values surged, and Canadians shifted their preferences on where to live. Meanwhile, households poured excess savings into demand deposits and paying down high interest rate debt. To the first three quarters of 2021, real estate continued its rapid ascent while savings rates leveled and investment portfolios performed quite well. I hope you have found this section informative. And with this, I'm going to pass things over to Jennifer to speak about the intergenerational transfer of wealth. Oh, thank you so much, Lynn. I have to say, I absolutely love the annual Wellscapes update. Uh, it is my favorite data set, and it's always so interesting to me to hear uh, and learn about how Canadians are in terms of their financial well-being. With that being said, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Jennifer Robbins. I'm the not-for-profit lead here at Enveronics Analytics. I'm really excited to be giving an update on the intergenerational transfer of wealth, as well as giving trends this year. Now with the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, as well as some of the wealth trends we've been seeing, plan giving has continued to be a very popular topic here at EA with our clients and our prospects. Now, Diving in, um, roughly about the mid 50s until the late 2010s, there's been $576 billion in inheritance that have been received by Canadians. Now, this is set to double, uh, reach about a trillion dollars by 2026, which is an incredible amount of money. One of the biggest trends we've been seeing, and which continues, um, basically continues to, to be a trend, is people wanting to gift an inheritance prior to their passing. So an example of this would be, you know, a boomer parent 
gifting a down payment to their millennial child. And this has been a trend for a few years now, but it's still gaining quite a lot of momentum. And when we think about this from the lens of not-for-profits, this is still kind of a question of how do you as an organization become part of that conversation? So let's take a deeper look into the wealth transfer trends for 2021. So last year, approximately $37 billion was given the inheritance, which is a lot of money. And similar to how I started things off and speaking about that intergenerational transfer of wealth, but this inheritance is not just for older generations. And although this distribution that we see here is fairly similar to what we saw in 2020, in 2020 uh, again, it, it's not simply, you know, your 65 plus or your 75 plus that are receiving inheritance. You see this huge contingent of under 55, you know, almost 40% who are receiving inheritance as well. Uh, and the, the conversation about who those people are and how to speak to them is, is for another day since we're talking about our trends. But I think it's really important to highlight and to understand that uh, inheritance is not just for uh, older populations. Now, when we take a look at this, uh, this transfer of wealth, uh, be a bit more of a geographical distribution, as many of you know, yay, we specialize in geography. So when we take a look at this um, from a provincial view, so we're looking at these aggregate dollars on the, the x-axis here, the, the aggregate dollars really align quite well to population, you know, Ontario being the most popular province or populated province, and then followed by Quebec, so on and so forth. Now, when we compare this to 2020, Ontario, Quebec, and PEI had the largest year-over-year -year increases. Sadly, this is probably linked to increased mortality rates due to COVID-19 pandemic. Now, Ontario increased their annual inheritance value by 300 million and Quebec by 200 million, respectively. Now, when we break this down more regionally, as we like to do, You'll see on the left hand side here that the estimated aggregate value. So this is that total dollars similar to what we just saw on the provincial slide. Whereas on the right hand side, these are the average dollars. And this is giving you a, a view of approximately how much someone would receive in an inheritance. You can see Toronto here on the left has the highest total dollars, again, aligning really well with the size of the population. Now, Vancouver here in the middle or sort of a little bit to the right middle, you can see that they have a, a lower aggregate dollar value. Again, somewhat population-wise, um, but what's really interesting with Vancouver is that that average dollars received is significantly higher than other regions. And uh, my thoughts are that this is likely a play on those uh, much higher than average real estate values that we've been seeing trending for several years now versus some of the trends that Lynn just spoke to that are a bit more in the, in the more recent past. Um, so real estate is really uh, likely playing a role in that, that average dollar value. Now, when we take a comparison to 2020, Toronto, Ottawa, and Quebec City saw the largest annual increase uh, with a 2% increase, uh, respectively. Now, on the average dollar, Quebec City and Surrey, BC both saw higher increases, again, at 2%. Now, we're going to switch gears a little bit, and let's dig into some of the key giving trends that we're seeing. Up first, this is a lay of the land of overall uh, overall donors, so to speak. So the, uh, the household population 15 plus that's made a financial gift in the past year. This is 70% of Canadians. So keeping in mind that this is not, uh, not simply those that have made a gift to directly to an organization or received a tax receipt. This would include someone who's made a gift at a checkout, um, someone who's given directly to a charitable organization or via crowdsourcing or supporting a friend who's posted, for example, a fundraiser on Facebook. This is the, the overall picture of someone who has, has made a financial gift in the past year. Now, proportionately speaking, we see Saskatchewan and Atlantic Canada donating at higher rates, so, so larger proportions of the population giving. And then at a more regional level, we see Ottawa, Quebec City, and St. John's all have higher rates of donors. And funnily enough, there's fewer Vancouverites who seem to be a donor. Now, as we all know, not all donors are created equal. So not all donors are the same. And this is on many different metrics, not just simply on uh, have they made a gift, but also that average gift or the type of donor or the type of program. 
So we obviously want to take a look at those, those donation dollars. And so what we're looking at here is charitable giving from our household spend. And this is broken out by religious and non-religious giving. So this is looking at tax receivable data, a little bit different of a view from the previous slide. And, what, when, and then when we take a look here at that year over year average donation dollar, we see that Alberta is uh, leading the way in terms of that average donation dollar, followed by BC, Manitoba and Ontario. But then when we look at the uh, year over year increase, you see Manitoba and Saskatchewan leading the way at the highest at six and 5.7% respectively. Now on that regional level, you see Toronto dominating that average charitable gift amount, as well as the year over year growth. And then it's followed by Calgary and then Vancouver. Continuing and taking a look at giving trends, let's take a look at channel of financial giving. So these are three out of, I believe, 12 categories of channels. And so we have direct mail is, is still the strongest channel in financial giving. There's certainly some interesting trends that we're seeing across the country. We have Saskatchewan that's showing up strongly for giving at charitable events, which is not entirely surprising as they also have the strongest, they are also the strongest province for volunteering. And then online giving tends to be strongest in those provinces with younger populations, such as Alberta and Saskatchewan. Now, when we take a look at the types of charitable organizations, the top five in Canada are health, social services, religion, hospitals, and sports and leisure. Now, social services is popping out quite strongly in British Columbia, as well as more regional level in Vancouver and Toronto. Um, and this might simply be that there are just more, uh, more opportunities, more available services to support. Now, what I personally find really interesting is this spike in the sports and leisure in the Prairie provinces. I think it's quite culturally interesting because it aligns with the need to volunteer for these activities to happen. And therefore, you know, we're also seeing this on the donation front as well is that those populations are giving to sports and leisure activities to ensure that they can actually happen. Now this last slide, the reasons for giving in the past year, I think is the most interesting to me. So compassion is the number one, and this is speaking to those urgent appeals or rallying cries, the COVID-19 crisis being one, Black the Black Lives Matter marches, and then of course today, our support uh, for Ukraine. That's what would fall into this compassion category. But number two causes, I think, is speaking to the core values and alignment with an organization. So this is really speaking to donors who, regardless of urgent appeals, are going to continue to give to the cause they hold near and dear to their heart. And I think this is a really great segue to our guest speaker. I am incredibly excited and honored to hand over the mic to Jessica Dennis, the Chief Development Officer at JDRF. And she's going to be speaking to how Capacity Day, as a lot of what Lynn spoke to, has helped her organization and uh, layering in that cause uh, as well. So without further ado, over to Jessica. Thank you. Okay, hi everyone. Um, it is an honor to speak to all of you today about JDRF's experience and using data to build our pipeline. So I'm Jessica Denise, I'm the Chief Development Officer at JDRF Canada. Want this to be very engaging. So. Put, put, put your questions in chat. Tell me which organization you're from. Uh, in the nonprofit sector, I think we're all kind of close and we're all family, so want to hear hear uh, hear from you. So, building, I want to speak to you a little bit about understanding your donor data. Donor data. It, I think it's one of the most important initiatives you can take to enable your organization's mission. Let me tell you about the steps JDRF took. To understand our data and if there's any I hope that this is helpful to you uh, and I have a few case studies to share as well and I want to acknowledge the incredible JDRF staff team we have who were instrumental in this approach. Uh, so JDRF launched a hundred million dollar campaign in 2020 uh, and before we launched this project we, we spent uh, some time this campaign we spent some time to understand uh, while planning for our campaign, our feasibility, that do we have prospects to meet this ambitious goal? So I'm gonna walk you through, we, we joined up with Enveronix and, and the, through this work that we did, this gave us the confidence to launch JDRF's most ambitious campaign to date. So it's, it's been incredibly uh, helpful for us. So I wanna share with you. So first of all, when I speak about building your pipeline, what do I mean? 
So pipeline management, it's a framework. It's a process that fundraisers go through when they work to find and nurture donors who ultimately become first time, repeat, mid-level or major gift donors. So KCI describes prospect pipeline management as the prospect pipeline, pipeline places cohorts of prospects at different stages of the development cycle. Um, and so this, that you can measure your progress on moving a donor through uh, your donor journey. So why is, this, why is this so important? Why should you invest in this or why should you spend time understanding it? This can build long-term sustainability for your organization. It's much e easier to keep your donors and engage them than it is to keep bringing in new donors. Uh, align your fundraising operations to where the pipeline is. So you can understand, if you understand your base, you can understand you have more potential in different markets and that's where you want to invest in. You can create steady streams of revenue through different gift levels. I think that, that shows the health of your organization, increase donor uh, loyalty, and really quantify and understand, understand your base. So, um, we, we looked at this study, a study was conducted in 2019 in the US asking 580 organizations about their major gifts program. 72% of those who missed their goal, missed their major gifts fundraising goal, stated that they were dissatisfied with their pipeline. And this stat, 87% used analyzing their database and 59% used wealth screening um, to, ensure their, to ensure their success. So this spoke to us in terms of how important, you know, top major gift uh, fundraising teams, what they're seeing and how important uh, those who are hitting their goals, uh, pipeline management it was uh, incredibly important. Oops, sorry about that. So how, how do you evaluate your database to understand your, your, your pipeline? I think this is really important. And so just want to kind of relay this to you, and I'm sure you've seen this before, but there's a couple meaningful parts here that, I, that were meaningful for me. So a strong prospect has the mix of all three, has high philanthropic propensity, it's often called inclination, it has mission connection, and has giving capacity. So you may have volunteers, or, uh, and uh, I think at every organization, who think the best thing to do is to look up someone who's wealthy and ask them for a major gift. Again, a strong prospect is both philanthropic and has a connection to your cause. So I think this is really important. And those working in specifically in the health charity sector where I've worked for, for many years, what I wanna do is relay is our experience. So we have found the connection to, to your mission, to our cause in particular was overwhelmingly important. So just as an example, I work at JDRF, which is an organization that raises funds for type one diabetes. Those who have a child with type one or a sibling or a spouse are more likely to give than someone who has no connection. So how do you understand that and measure that within your database so that you can rank your, your base to understand where you have the most potential? So for, for us and from my experience, personal connection to your mission is really critical and to understand that when um, building your pipeline. So how how do you how do you what what are the things that you should would look at? So when we met up with Enveronics, what we uh, did is we they, or they helped us is to create wealth capacity ratings, looking at all the information here in the in the left gray box. They use that information uh, to understand our donor base. Who are they? What are they like? What are their interests? These are the things that really help you get a baseline. This will help you change how you communicate. Is your average age of your donor 30 or is it 50? That will change your communication, what you use, your style. It allows you to be more strategic. So um, another just want to point out what you can also use is Google Analytics to just it. This will give you information on who's hitting your website, who's using your social media channels to just understand gender, average age. All of these are data points that you can use to understand. And you can overlay this data and compare it to some of the information we've seen earlier around average Canadian household income, net worth, average charitable giving to know if your donor base has a you know, potentially higher income, is on average or below, or is more charitable. So this helped us really start to say, what is our, what is our average donor look like at JDRF? So what we did is we used these data sources um, as well as overlaid some of our own information, really use this and connectivity to diabetes, which was critical and donation history to really score and understand our prospect pipeline. 
Now at this, whoops, sorry, I went a little fast. At this point, when we worked with Enveronics, we got a ton of data. We got, a, we had our whole database uh, ranked and mapped and you get a little bit data paralysis. You just say, what do we do now? I don't, I'm not even sure what the next step is. So what we did, and this is what I wanna share and I hope this is helpful. We created segments to really understand and take this giant list and, and break them into quadrants. So this is what we came up with. And want to acknowledge my team members who are on the phone who, who did a lot of this work to come up with this. So what we looked at is creating a nine block. And I don't know if you've seen these before for either managing people uh, or other, other models, but a nine block looks at you know, two different ways of looking at your data. So first we looked at, as you, know, you can see along the bottom, connection to your mission. Uh, do they have a high connection? a mid connection and no. So for us, again, using type one diabetes as an example, we rank someone who has a child with type one as a high connection. Someone in mid connection could be a friend, they know a friend or no connection. So we, we created these, these uh, ratings or were acronyms to understand the connection and then overlay giving capacity and philanthropic propensity that we worked with Enveronics to get. This created a nine block. So you can see here in the top right, this is your top major gift prospects. They have high capacity, they're highly philanthropic, and they have a personal connection to, you, to your mission. Now over here in the middle, these are still high capacity, very philanthropic, they have some connection. So you may need to use a different approach. Now again, the yellow, high capacity, high connection. Again, I wanna just underscore, it's, we say no connection, we don't know if they have a connection. So you don't wanna write off this group. This allowed us to create quadrants to understand how to talk to our donors in different ways, whether we talk about our annual giving program, our mid-level giving program, or a major gift program. Now, I just want to give you kind of like a drill down a little bit on the high capacity segments. So what do I mean? We call them HCHC, high capacity, high connection. We used Enveronics donor rank, the top rating, the top net worth, the top donor potential, top social values, and we pulled this. And we overlaid this with people who are most connected to diabetes. What we found, and this is pretty exciting, 70% uh, of this group hadn't made a gift for, since 2017. This excited us because we saw this is a truly, uh, we're unearthing potential donors who we haven't engaged. So that, I think that's what you want to do in, in going through an exercise like this. Oops, so let me go back. So you may think, so we created this theory and then we said, let's test it just to make sure we're right. We wanna make sure before we go out, we're really right. So what did we do? We looked at donors in high capacity segments that we just listed. And we said, what were their average lifetime giving and their, their, their lifetime gifts, their average gift size, just to say, are we doing this right? Um, so we found that people in the high capacity segments that we had rated have a three to four times higher lifetime giving than the mid capacity and even higher than the base. So we knew, okay, we're on the right track here. At a 200 to 300 times higher lifetime gifts than your base capacity. So we knew, check, that we tested this theory. The second then we wanted to test the theory around personal connection. So does it really make a difference? And we, could we see it in our gifts? So we saw that we had a, there was a 3.5 times higher gifts in um, high connection then, sorry, the, and people that were connected, then not connected. So therefore we know that they, people with a direct connection is critical. So again, we tested this theory and then we went out and started engaging with their donors. We used this approach to communicate, to build our, our, our pipeline and to use account management with our team. So just wanna show you what this, how this, you could overlay this. So we built these quadrants, we overlaid it to understand where our donors live? Do we have more high capacity? We just looked at all the stuff that Lynn showed us. Do we have more in central Canada? We have, do we have more in East? And this helped us understand where to put resources. I'm just gonna go through a couple more slides because I'm watching the time. Case studies, we had two case studies I wanted to show you. Study one, uh, we a donor that was ranked high capacity, high connection. So again, in that red quadrant, we noticed they'd made one gift to us in 2019, $300. So we thought, what do we do? As many organizations do, when you have a stewardship matrix, follow-up thank you calls are usually done at a certain level. So this donor never received a follow-up call because they were below that, that level for us. So this is a flaw in stewardship matrix. But after this review, 
with Enveronics, we learned this donor that lived in a postal code where the average net worth was 16 million. And then the annual charitable gifts average was 150,000 a year. So we knew, we knew that we needed to engage this donor. We've reached out and we've started discussing our campaign. Just wanna show you one more case study. So one more is we looked at a donor that was ranked high capacity, high connection. We used prospect research to dive deeper on this quadrant. We went deeper to make sure we really understand it and understood this group. We identified a possible volunteer connection to this donor, this prospect. Uh, we were introduced by this, this uh, volunteer. And the first thing the, the donor said is, how did you find me? I haven't made a gift, I think since 2007. How did you find me? And she was impressed and pleased that we found her. And after the first meeting, she made, made a major gift. So it was pretty astonishing, out, out, outstanding and doesn't happen very often. So I just wanted to wrap with saying um, my final advice, don't wait to undertake a project like this. It will be work that can transform your organization. Uh, JDRF has doubled our revenue for major gifts in one year. Um, we have established a prospect pipeline. We've moved to a donor-centered fundraising approach, and we've just changed how we engage our donors. It actually all started here. It all started with this work. So I don't want to make it sound like this was the only project that grew our major gift program, but it was the first. And I wanted to make the offer to anyone. If you ever want to bounce ideas off of me, please feel free to reach out. Well, thank you so much, Jessica. That is incredible to see, and the EA team I can say without any hesitation or without any doubt is always so excited to hear these success stories because that's exactly what we put all this work and effort into, into having our partners find the success and raise all this money. So that is tremendous to hear. Um, just looking at the time, we have about eight minutes and we have a number of questions. So I'm going to um, ask some of our speakers some of the questions that I've, uh, that I've been seeing. So why don't I go to the very first one? And it comes from Christine. Um, I believe Jennifer is probably the best person to answer this. So I'll throw it your way first. Um, Christine asks for crowdfunding. Do you separate that out to be specifically to charitable organizations or all crowdfunding? So how do we deal with the crowdfunding portion of donations? And is that accounted to the numbers? Because they do skew some of the numbers or potentially could skew some of the numbers. So if you mm -hmm. want to answer that question. Yeah, Christine, that's a really great question. Um, so there's a few different ways to answer the question. And I know that I got kicked off the internet, so I didn't get to tell you some of my story. <laughs> um, but the, so the slide that we we're looking at where I specifically talked about crowd, crowd, um, crowdfunding being part of that. So this is a, a survey-based data giving back. And so it's looking at the number I was giving you was was all Canadians that have basically said they've made a donation of some sort. And I wanted to, to be very specific in the examples I gave, especially the giving at checkout, because that's not tracked, right? That's not CRA receivable. So it's just giving you an idea of the 70% of the population, basically adults really, are giving gifts of some sort. And the crowdfunding somewhat falls into that same as that giving that $2 at the checkout because you it's not receipted. So that is captured in that proportion of donors, but that's not data that would be captured in our dollar value. So um, any of the dollar values that you didn't get to see, but you will get to see when you receive uh, copies of the deck, um, will, uh, that would not include crowdsourcing dollars because they're not uh, receivable by the CRA. So in that sense, no, the data wouldn't be skewed. What you're seeing is a representative picture of people who give in general. And then the, the dollar values is people who are giving to reputable, um, recognized charitable organizations. So I hope that helps. Perfect. Thank you. The next question is going to go to Jessica. And it's, can you speak to how you got organizational buy-in? I know we get that question a lot. Um, and we do hear about this. So I'm kind of curious how you went about getting buy-in in your organization. Okay, and thank you for the question. Ines, I see you on, you put in the chat. So hi, nice to see you. Um, it, organizational buy-in was difficult and it took some time, but I'm gonna tell you, once I presented this data, this, this, this data, what I showed was a game changer. This is what we, what we presented to get uh, approval uh, from all levels, to get that support to go boldly into growing our major gifts program. So you can't argue with data. So I encourage you to use your data to prove your case. Perfect, thank you so much. Um, the next question, Lynn, um, will go to you. Um, 
everyone's kind of interested or there was an individual interested um, about the increase in interest rates. We hear about this, that it's coming, um, that um, we're going to start seeing that. I believe the Bank of Canada yesterday made some announcements. So um, the question is more about the impacts of interest rates. And you kind of touched upon it a little bit, um, something to see. Um, but do you have sort of some guesstimates about what how that's going to impact things? Um, it's hard to say exactly what's going to happen in terms of any sort of economic future. Um, in terms of real impacts of rising interest rates, almost immediately anybody who has floating rate debt, such as a home equity line of credit or um, a mortgage that's a variable rate mortgage, those rates will be increasing. Um, and then fixed rate mortgage rates will also be going up um, in the short term. That lags a little bit because people are able to lock in their mortgage rates for a certain period of time. Um, so, you know, typically we might see the impact starting to be seen in the real estate market at, you know, two to three month lag. Okay. Um, so, so yeah, those are probably the main impacts that we're going to see, just increased cost of borrowing um, beginning to affect household finances. All right, perfect, thank you. And I guess, you know, we can definitely say that with less discretionary income and people sort of needing to refocus on their housing and their costs, their, their costs, it means slightly less donations. Um, when we're looking more at the annual giving and maybe at the mid-level. Um, one of the things we did see at EA is major gifts. The people who have money, this won't really generally impact them because they won't be having mortgages on their households for the most part. Um, and the swings even in the, the stocks and other areas that they have holdings that won't necessarily impact their giving as well. Maybe how they give or some of that transactional. Um, and Jessica, if you have a point on that, please feel free to jump in. So your mixed giving um, to an organization might change, whether it's stock holdings that you hand over or is it other sort of assets. But generally speaking, major those that can give in a major way will continue to give in a major way. So I don't know if you have anything to add to that, Jessica. Yeah, I was just going to say we saw a big increase in, in stock gifts for shares, as well as we saw people paying their pledges faster because the stock market was doing so well people were using this chance to pay off a five-year pledge in, in a shorter period of time. So more liquidity would mean paying pledges quicker. Yeah. So the interest rates will kind of go the opposite way for that. Great. Thank you. Um, and then another question we have um, comes back to you, Jessica. Um, and I believe this is coming from Ines. I apologize if I mispronounced your name. What is the best way to find out if your donors have a connection to your cause? So do you want to speak to maybe how you guys map that out sure so we um every gift online we ask it's a mandatory field so that we've been doing that for years and i think that has populated this our database with how people are connected whether making a ten dollar gift or a two hundred dollar gift we ask every single time so that's been the biggest driver for us and encourage those on the line who haven't set that up it's an easy thing to set up people don't mind not filling it in it can drive critical information that can be a game changer to them being a prospect or not. Perfect. And that's a great reminder um, for everybody. That's the easiest thing you could do. You don't have to pay a vendor or a charity. It's just keeping track of those things can really help your organization better understand how to sort of who your donors are, who your volunteers are, constituents, and just connect with them. So that's terrific advice and a great question. So seeing as we have about a minute left, I just want to thank everyone. I want to thank all the speakers. Uh, Lynn, Jennifer, Jessica, thank you so much for today. I know we had some technical difficulties, so I will say that um, we will resend the, the deck to everybody and we will re-record a couple of the portions. So this way you can clearly see um, what was presented as well as what was missed due to our internet issues. And everybody should have it in their inbox probably within the next week. So we will try our best to hit that. And thank you so much for attending. And if you have any other questions, please reach out to any of us here at EA um, and or we'll connect you to Jessica. Um, and thank you so much again, Jessica, for joining us today. That's phenomenal. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.